Hello, it's Scott Manley here. 50 years ago this week, Apollo 14 landed on the moon. Commanded by Alan Shepard with Ed Mitchell as the lunar module pilot, it would be the last of the H-type missions before the lunar rover was introduced on Apollo 15. This mission was 18 months since Apollo 11, and in the intervening time, some upgrades had been made to the spacecraft. Most importantly, problems with Apollo 13 had to be addressed in the name of safety. But there was one upgrade that fixed a problem with Apollo 11. A problem which has become a key part of the mythology of that first lunar landing in 1969. We all know that story. During the final moments of the landing on the moon, while Neil was manually flying the lander over the surface looking for a safe place to put down, the descent quantity warning light came on, showing that the propellant in the tanks was low. In operational terms, this meant that the crew had 94 seconds before the bingo call. Now obviously this was a tense situation, but Neil kept his cool. He flew the lander to the surface and shut down the engine with 20 seconds to spare before bingo. The call from Mission Control always makes me smile. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue, we're breathing again, thanks a lot. And that really you know, put a cap on all the drama that had come before. Everyone was finally happy that Neil had made it. So. This is often translated to or told as Apollo 11 making it to the surface with only 20 seconds of fuel remaining. The truth is that the margin was a bit bigger than that. For a start, the bingo call still included another 20 seconds of margin to allow a landing on the moon if they were too close to initiate an abort back to orbit. But on top of this, analysis of the flight showed that the low fuel warning had actually triggered about 30 seconds early. The propellant inside those tanks would slosh around as the spacecraft maneuvered and this resulted in the propellant uncovering the low end of the level centers early, long enough to trigger that warning and get everyone into <laughs> landing mindset a little early. Though the same early trigger would happen on Apollo 12, but it was less of a problem on that mission because they were right on target and they didn't have to traverse across the lunar surface looking for a clear spot to put down. Now, later missions would need to use more fuel for the landing and they would, because they were carrying the rover, so they needed to solve this problem. They wanted to get all the margin they could. So on Apollo 13, the engineers were trying to characterize the slosh and they modified the instrumentation and the telemetry so that they would get high rate data from the propellant tanks and let them figure out the dynamics of the slosh process. The engineers were understandably disappointed that they never got the data they wanted, although they probably weren't as disappointed as the crew of Apollo 13. But even before Apollo 11, fuel slosh was a well-known phenomenon. In the early development of the LEM, they had test rigs with plexiglass model of the proposed tank design, so they could push these around, wobble them and shake them, and watch how the fuel inside would slosh around. And as a result of this, they came up with uh, some small baffles at the bottom of the tanks. But these were primarily there as an anti-vortex baffle. That is, some extra hardware that's supposed to suppress the vortex generated when you drain a tank out of liquid. Like when you're draining a sink or a bathtub, you might see a little whirlpool forming. And while that's really interesting if you've got a bathtub, it's actually a really bad thing for propellant tanks because when you're draining those tanks, you want to have liquid, you don't want to have bubbles of gas because rocket engines don't react to bubbles particularly well. So yeah, all fuel tanks and rockets will have structures to suppress this. So this small cross-shaped baffle wasn't enough to really slow the slosh that caused the low propellant light. So Northrop Grumman engineers came up with a new design. It was a large circle with fins. It was about eight inches tall, 17 inches wide, and it was made of thin perforated metal. But there was a problem. The lunar module for Apollo 14 had already been assembled and they didn't really have time to take the whole thing apart, open up the tanks and add new hardware. So they had to insert and secure this baffle via a small hole in the bottom of the tanks where they would take the propellant out. This was 2.4 inches across, six centimeters. The thin metal that they used was springy enough that they could actually roll it up 
and feed it into the tank and then have it pop out. And then inside there, they had to assemble it, weld it and fix it to the structure through this small access hole. It was an amazing feat of keyhole rocket surgery. I don't think this keyhole surgery technique was used for the later missions because we actually have photos of the Apollo 15 tanks which they had opened up because they wanted to expand the tanks for the larger capacity needed for the J-type missions. Anyway, Apollo 14 proceeded as planned. They landed on the moon, Alan Shepard got to play golf, and he wasn't harassed by unnecessary fuel warning lights on the way down. Although in orbit, they did have to hack their computer to make the landing possible. And that is another amazing story which you should learn about if you don't know. So the fuel in those tanks sloshing around it isn't just a problem for the low level warning light coming on early. The majority of the vehicle mass is in those propellant tanks. And when they started sloshing around, the whole vehicle would wobble in response to this. So there are several times during the Apollo descents that you can see the vehicle rocking back and forth a good few degrees as the fuel sloshes around in response to Neil maneuvering the vehicle. And you know, in general, there are other engineering problems around handling propellants for spaceflight. Again, you want to be able to guarantee that when you open the valves, you get a liquid rather than a gas. And in zero G, everything just floats around, the gas and the liquid misses, mixes. Um, so, you know, we can see photographs of this and video sometimes from cameras that are inside the propellant tanks. SpaceX has a, a camera inside the second stage oxygen tank of the Falcon. And we sometimes see this in the uh, broadcasts. So yeah, vehicles will settle the propellant beforehand. They'll use small thrusters to uh, basically put the propellant at the bottom of the tank. You'll hear in the Apollo transmissions, talks about ullage burns where they're using the RCS thrusters to accelerate the vehicle and let the propellant know which way is up. Um, even closer to Earth, you'll see the first stage of Virgin Orbit's rocket. They use a propellant settling thruster immediately after it's dropped from Cosmic Girl before the main engine lights up. Uh, Starship. Now, Starship has these small header tanks, and those are designed to allow the engines to start when the vehicle is in the horizontal orientation rather than the vertical orientation. Uh, for some applications, we have propellant tanks which have bladders in them. Those will contain the liquid and the gas pressure compresses the outside of the bladder, squeezing the liquid out, rather like squeezing a tube of toothpaste or something, but the toothpaste being a little more liquid. There's other systems I've seen where you use a piston. And in the case of the Lance missile that I looked at, what you have is a flat disc inside the propellant tank, a gas generator that pushes that disc down, squeezing the propellant out the bottom. On the Apollo missions, they use supercritical propellant storage for the fuel cells, right? And that's where you keep the gas at a high enough pressure and high enough temperature that the difference between the liquid and the gas disappears so that when you tap it off, you get a consistent amount of material. And yeah, that was the tank that exploded on Apollo 13. Uh, stored propellants also need to be kept, by the way, in the right temperature range, uh, even when they are possibly sitting paired up with other propellants which have completely different uh, temperature needs, right? Such as cryogenic liquid oxygen next to hydrogen or kerosene. In the massive first stages of the Saturn V, the liquid oxygen lines would actually run through the middle of the propellant tank. And that would mean the oxygen in these lines would be heated. And if you just let that sit, that would mean the oxygen would boil and it would sort of geyser up into the main oxygen tank. So to avoid this, they had to make the oxygen circulate and they did this by bubbling uh, helium through it and that would keep the oxygen, liquid oxygen saturated or agitated enough that it wouldn't turn into a geyser in the middle of their tanks. Uh, and you know, other engineering challenges, things like the propellant tanks are actually also structural articles. So when you're designing a propellant tank, you're gonna rely on the pressure sometimes to give it the extra structural rigidity that it needs in flight. So, you know, we started out talking about Apollo 14, but what I really want to get to is that it's very easy to look at these propellant tanks on rockets and think that they're, you know, relatively simple, low-tech constructs, but 
you know, to get a rocket flying, there's actually a lot of research, design and engineering that has to be done even on these to make them do their job as well as they should. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.